Great. Thank, thank you so much. So I look out in this room and I see uh, people here from the public sector, from the private sector. I see, you know, some of those tenured uh, professors who are also members of the ISSP, uh, and I have no doubt that you all have questions and comments that you would want to uh, put to the panel. So we have a microphone here, if you wouldn't mind just going to the microphone because we are recording uh, the session, and please, uh, if you could maybe just brief introduction to yourself and then your question or comment. Uh, my name is... Uh, so <laughs> my name is Sarin Khan. Um, I have my own small business. I'm lecturing all over the world about uh, innovation management. I have a number of challenges to address to you. Number one is, uh, what do you think about the discrepancy, the disconnection between the very high level of education in Canada versus the uh, lower performance and lower and lower performance in terms of competitiveness uh, worldwide? And uh, I did a study 10 years ago together with the Chamber of Commerce and BDC and EDC looking at commercialization of innovations in Canada. Mm -hmm. It was at the time when Canada was beating itself by having such a huge gap in methods of innovation. And the study proved that there is no gap in methods of scientific and technology innovation. The gap is all on the business and commercialization side. Uh, on that basis, uh, we created a Center for Business Innovation at the Conference Board studying uh, business innovation at the firm level, big studies all over the Canadian industry. Conclusion was that innovation is more a matter of culture than technology, and that uh, academia does not support innovation in Canadian industry. It operates at a different, uh, in a different time frame than industry does. Uh, Canada spends a fortune on academic science and technology development. Canada does not spend and academia does not pay any attention to the business management, innovation management, and commercialization. As far as I know, at least two years ago, there was no course on commercialization in any of the Canadian universities. So how can you achieve real results if you do not deploy your innovations or your scientific developments and such? So that's a challenge. So what are you doing about training for business innovation in Canadian education in business schools or even more important in the uh, science and engineering schools because you expect all those uh, millions of, uh, two million of CEOs in Canada to come, most of them come from the science engineering field and they have very little knowledge about commercialization, about management and, and such and they are going to fail. I have never seen a company that declined, they died because the workers were not good. They all die because the executives make the wrong decisions. And we don't do much, Chamber of Commerce included, about the training and the skills at the management of innovation level. By the way, uh, one of the results from one of the studies was that less than 50% of Canadian companies have any measures for innovation at the corporate level. And their performance is about 40% less than the performance of the companies that have good measures for innovation. You talk about evidence-based, but Canadian governments, federal or provincial, they measure performance at the end of the program, not during the progress of the program. So you need to measure that stuff. And uh, by the way, I'm leading now the ISO, International Standards Organization, efforts to create a standard, a guidance standard for innovation measurement. So I welcome participation in that activity. And the other challenge, one more challenge. Yes, one more, and then we'll get to Exactly, one more challenge is we talked about climate change, and climate change happens. Mm -hmm. But what I have seen, again, and innovation is about taking the risk and take advantage of opportunities. We talk a lot about how to fight against climate change. But if climate change happens, and it's going to happen, Canada is one of the few countries that can benefit for climate change. What are we doing in Canada to take advantage? Not to be defensive, but be competitive about taking advantage of climate change. Very little. And academia doesn't do its job. <laughs> Comments from the panelists. Jason makes me think of a recent uh, discussion that we had on some of these points. Yeah, can I grab the uh, um, To the point of lower performance in Canada and, and, and the uh, some of the challenges that exist there. I, com I 
this is a discussion that happens frequently also in the UK, because the UK spends a disproportionate amount of money on science versus the productivity. And there's questions about what is the gap there. Um, and I think uh, there are many hypotheses. Um, I think one of them relates to the culture of academia and the need to build more relationships and think about the exploration there. And that ties back to a, a point that Denise touched on just briefly in one of her comments, which is, where the universities aren't keeping up the private sector or other entities are gonna step in and do it. I mentioned very briefly our How to Change the World program. When we run it at UCL, with all those partner organizations, they glom on and say, we love this, could you please run it outside? We started running it for the Royal Society, of Engin uh, Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, the National in the US, and very quickly my faculty turned around and said, we have day jobs, so we can't do that. So we had to spin it out. So we've set up a nonprofit to deliver it. We're delivering one in Canada in February in Toronto, which is all around bringing engineers together with business, together with early career professionals, together with more senior experts in the programs. And we've had the deans of engineering and the deans of business school across Ontario and, and, and Eastern Quebec jump all over it and say, we love this. We want to participate. We want to send our students. I do think that there is need to create those things that it's not just about putting all the pressure on academia or all the pressure on business or all the pressure on government. It's also about just identifying those gaps and running some experiments. Because honestly, even when you address that, there are, uh, I, I had a, an American colleague who was, uh, 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 he, he served as the former Secretary of Commerce, and he turned around and said, the productivity gap in Britain and Canada is easy to explain. You're all just too damn nice to each other. You need to be more aggressive in order to get more productivity. And I sort of sat there and went, there's a certain truth to that in the, I spent some time in Silicon Valley, they, they cut through very quickly to get very aggressive about, is, the, is this a transactional relationship that will work? No, thank you, I'm, I'm done, next one, next one, next one. I'm not sure though that that fits very well with Canadian values of the sort of life we wanna live. So I would also argue to your second point of, of climate change but broadening it out a little bit, it's not just about productivity, it's about well-being as well. And I do think that these are conversations that don't necessarily connect, but also, but it's important to think about that in the broader context of these things, because they're often very siloed conversations in that space, so. Um, so, I don't have the scientific answer for, for that, and what I will say, it could be debated, but there's one thing I have noticed about the most productive countries, is that they have the highest number of people in professional and technical education and training. This is the one characteristic that they all share in common. And so I think that part, I don't mean it's the solution, but I think that part of the solution is that. And from a productivity perspective, you know, each engineer needs about four technicians. We produce Four engineers for one technician. I think there's an issue here. Um, I, have, I have a cool story, because many of you are at university, and I think you will love it. Um, we had two colleges, uh, one in Quebec and one in Montreal, that wanted to get into training of AI. So they said, we want to do that. And some of the universities said, come on, this is AI. And they said, but no, we're serious. We would like to offer some things in AI. So what they decided to do, they sat about 12 universities together uh, in Quebec, and they asked them, are there things that your researchers don't like to do in AI? So they began to have list, long, long, long list. And they said to them, what would you say if we would begin to offer program that would train people that would know how to do those things. The people said, what, really? You could do that? So the reasons why I'm sharing this is that I think sometimes we, we don't necessarily have the, how do we say? Um, we, we don't do, the, the things at the right place all the time. And you know what they said, those universities? Could we be the first one to pick the people to come to work for us? 
And those two programs at each of those colleges, they don't stop. They have to create core, core art at each semester because it's so popular. So I think all that to say, I think if there would be more collaboration between colleges and universities to see how we can complement each other, how can we, we can work more together instead of you know, trying to compete and, and all that, I really think there would be a lot of value. Um, I'll just answer the second question after, not the third one, because of time. Um, and I'm not sure what I would answer also. Um, but it's the one on research. We have a good news story in Canada. And it's with the applied research done in the colleges. Uh, most of it leads to commercialization. Currently, the government spends only $90 million of dollars a year for the all the colleges across the countries and all the polytechnics. As you can know, it's peanuts, 90 million. And for each dollar now that the federal government is giving, there is a dollar from other source, which is a good news story. And because of that, 6,400 companies, most of them SMEs, like the one Leah talked about, were able to develop new products, new services, or new processes. And that means job creation. It means better productivity because they had better processes. So I think one way to improve would really be by increasing that amount of money. Because right now, it's really insufficient for the uh, number of projects that uh, SMEs, or the number of problems SMEs have that they need to, uh, to have solved. Leah, did you have a, yeah, some brief remarks? Yeah, just really briefly, because yeah. I couldn't agree more. And, and in the vein of pro provocation, when the colleges and universities are at the table, invite the business community oh, as yes. well. Oh, yes, of course. No, like, course. really? Yeah. But All this is, yeah, well. That's, that's why you're here. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, the commercializ yeah. RD commercialization is worth a whole other panel. I'll just flag the fact that we flagged, you know, the idea of entrepreneurship as one yeah. of these core durable yeah. skills. Yeah. So I see we've got a couple <laughs> more questions here. We have a very limited amount of time, so I'll ask you to keep your questions uh, brief. Okay. Uh, Sister Jay Prasad, and I've spent a lifetime in, in policy in, in the city here in various parts of government and innovation, science, technology, energy, economic policy, and so on, transportation policy. And tonight, right after here, I'll be seeing a lot of people at the Canadian Centre of Living Standards, and, and there'll be lots of deputy ministers and so on. And they'll be talking about these issues about productivity, the standard of living, and so on. But a question I have. Three quick things. One is, one of the biggest challenges in Canada when we turn the questions around is management, right? There's management. Management is a big issue. And I'm wondering when we look at this, and whether through the academics or, or various areas, how you think that could be best handled. And you know, when you look at it quick and nimble, you will see some of the issues of management that, that, that are there and how you handle some of this. The other issue was, you know, the question was raised about um, being in science policy. Um, when I was at the science policy conference, where I played a big role in terms of volunteering, I met a lot of young um, graduates who were coming out, and they wanted to be in policy. And they didn't really know what policy was. Mm -hmm. But they were studying in science, but they wanted to be in science policy. And it was really striking to see people have spent so much time and what they were doing want to be in policy. So I'm wondering if there should be some mentorship in that area is one thing. I volunteer with junior achievers, and I see that this is the group of people that will be coming to the university. And I'm wondering if universities should be playing a bigger role in that program. Now, through the executive MBA, we've helped a number of students in that program. And I'm wondering if there are areas in which you think some of the colleges, universities should be playing a bigger role in that. Great. Maybe what I'll do is I'll ask people to hold their thoughts, and we'll have our final question, and then everyone can have a, a minute to, to, to wrap up. 
Right. I'm Dan Perry. I'm a core member of the ISSP. I have a 17-part question. <laughs> for so, no, um, I just I know the title of today's presentation: the evolution of higher education, shifting models to sorry, shifting to interdisciplinary models. Um, I'm curious. We've heard a lot about science, engineering, business school. Where do arts and humanities and some of the social sciences fit into your vision that's being described at the table? That's a question. Thanks. Okay, great. So why don't we just move from right to, to left and, and we'll bring it on home. Sure. So I can speak specifically to the science policy space. So, um, you know, having gone, I graduated from my PhD in 2016, so I'm fairly new in this field. But at E4D, I get phone calls all the time from students who are saying like, hey, tell me, you know, how you got to where you are. You know, how do you get involved in science policy? How do I, I work translating my science into a way that decision makers might use it? all the time. And a lot of these students are sort of at the end of their PhDs and wanting to get involved in those policy discussions and have no idea, you know, who, who to talk to to get those skills. And they haven't even thought about it. Or, you know, they're sitting in their labs and they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm watching things happen or unfold in the news that I wish that I could add my voice to that conversation. So I think that that mentorship space is hugely important. Um, and I think that there's a lot of like really cool opportunities for students. Um, so things like Action Canada that students can do while they're in um, you know, graduate programs, which is really great. Um, but it's also cool to see some good examples that are happening at university. So when I was at UBC, where I was doing my PhD, I used to do regular lectures in a course that was about science, society, and policy. But it was a brand new course, and it, I was really surprised to know that there wasn't really any of that happening at the university. So it was for people who were generally in BSc programs, but it was about you know, the translation of science into policy making, or how does science actually translate into the real world? And they would do things like case studies or look at the news and be like, okay, well, how was that decision made and how could it have been made differently if, you know, a scientist was around the table? So it's cool to see courses like that starting to crop up. We also just did, so during the election season, I ran a vote science campaign with a number of other organizations across Canada to put science and research on the election agenda. Um, and a professor at Ryerson actually re reached out to us and said, okay, how can I get my students involved in the campaign? And so what she had them do is, um, you know, choose an issue that they were passionate about and then engage with a candidate or an elected official on that issue. And she actually integrated it into her curriculum. And the students were really excited about it. And they felt for the first time, a lot of them, it was the first time they'd ever reached out to an elected official and some of them got responses. So I think that there's a lot of appetite, but there's just not a lot of places for students to go. And I think that having champions, whether that's professors or you know, government or other students who have left and gone into the science policy space are ways that we could help bridge those gaps. Great, final thoughts from you, uh, yeah, Leah? Just really briefly, because there's so much we could say, but yeah, you know, it's, it's the idea of breaking down silos, right? Yeah. It's this whole conversation on this in, in interdisciplinary, which I know doesn't have a lot of traction, a lot of, um, places, but it's, you know, it is, you know, to your point, it's even, you know, doctors who are trained who can't run the business, right? It's, it's the engineers who become the CEOs, it's the science who need the policy, and I guess, you know, that would sort of be, um, you know, because it's, is it arts or is it science, is it cyber, is it, you know, business, is it government, it, it's collaboration, I guess that would be the bottom line. Denise, you really twigged on the uh, social sciences and humanities yeah. comment. Okay. Um, okay. I'll I'll do I'll do that. In fact, I'm a prime example of that. My first degree was in science, and the second one, uh, when I started to work, I started to teach. Uh, in fact, theater, arts, uh, no theater, poetry, and literature. Okay. It was that was the program in grade twelve. And I felt, oh my God, where are my humanities? So I started another degree because I felt it was missing. And when I was uh, doing my degree in science, I didn't have the opportunity to do that. There were only two electives that you could do and I got credits for my Latin and I, my Spanish of high school. So because of that, initially I was happy, but after I realized I had missed something. And so now there are a number of institutions uh, in our colleges and institutes that what they have started to do is in fact encourage more interdisciplinary uh, programs. Even if I looked at BCIT, the students can make up their entire degree. It's all by choice depending on the competencies that they want to choose. And the other thing that I could tell you is that um, 
our post-grad certificates in the college systems are extremely, extremely popular because of that. Uh, it means that you can be from engineering, but then you go to do a one year in marketing or in environment, or you do a one year in uh, art, uh, and it helps you, in fact, to develop another aspect, and you are more marketable on the labor, labor market. So, okay. And management, I forgot to ask that question. My answer would be change management. That's the solution. <laughs> nice easy one on that one. <laughs> Jason. Um, Dan, thank you for asking that because I, I, I really do think that, uh, it, let me start with saying we often are very good at talking about our successes in innovations in, in, and I'm guilty of that here. One of the ways in which I really struggled in setting up the department at UCL, and particularly courses like How to Change the World, was how to bring the communities together across the, the literally, we design, we design our campuses so that the sciences are over there, and the humanities and the social sciences are over there, the lawyers we put over there, and it, it's, it, it, it's silos to begin with. And How to Change the World, the, it, it's a nice, arrogant title for a course to begin with. And so the first value that we put there is humility, because we try and, and encourage the students to reflect on the fact that whatever you do, whether it's design a business, do policy, design a technology, or whether you're designing art, theater, literature, you're changing somebody's world. We want you to think about whose world you're trying to change, and do they actually want it changed that way? You know, that's an important bit of the conversation there. And the social sciences and humanities are critical to that conversation. But one of the real challenges that I have never quite figured out how to bridge, uh, my, one of my undergrads is in English Lit. I, I, I love the, uh, the arts and humanities, and we need to be encouraging and integrating that in. But the, the process of thinking for the social sciences, particularly when we engage, is critical social sciences. It's critical analysis. It's tearing ideas apart and really understanding them in depth. Engineers just want to solve a damn problem. Stop making it harder. And that's the sort of how do you bring those two communities together and get each to recognize actually there's value on both sides. Yes, you have to solve. We actually want to solve these problems. The social scientists want to solve the problems too. But they want to dig in, and they're trained to analyze and dig deeper. So how do we build those spaces? How can we as faculty create the, the holding environment so that tension, that frustration that mounts up when trying to talk across that divide is constructive and not wanting to throw your coffee at the other person? Um, and, and, but that, again, is a skill of brokering relationships how many faculty members do we train to, to get their students to the right level of constructive tension and then be able to manage that emotional relationship? I don't have a degree in psychology. How am I supposed to do that? So I think these are some of the conversations that I don't know how we do it, but it feels to me like that's where the nugget of the opportunity and the challenges, and we need to run more experiments, and we need to share those experiments with each other, and the failures much more often to say, well, that really didn't work. Um, but here's why, and here's what we can learn and go forward. So thank you very much for raising that, because I think we skip over that Good too quickly. Question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this, um, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone in the room here that this was a very uh, productive and fruitful and provocative, thank you, Jason, uh, conversation. It sets us up extraordinarily well for our discussions tomorrow, as, as you might imagine, heading up the ISSP. That's one of my preoccupations is what is our role uh, in, uh, in this space. Um, so I'd like to invite everyone to join me in thanking the panel. I'd also like to thank, without whose support this would not have been possible, uh, Brendan Frank, who is our Interim Research Director. Brendan did a lot of yeoman's work to pull this together. Thank you, Brendan. And Raphael Dizaldi, who ordered the wine, so. <laughs> So we'd like to invite you to join us. There is a, a little reception here afterwards. You'll have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to chat with other folks in the audience and obviously with our panelists as well. Thank you so much uh, for coming. À la prochaine.